All right, we can turn me up and I can just wait. All right, okay, you can hear me? All right, everyone, welcome. Welcome to the very first Rock Talk of the summer season 2023. <laughs> I am really happy that you're here, here in the room and online with us. Uh, my name is Jennifer Seavey and I'm the executive director here at Shoals Marine Laboratory. For those of you joining for the first time, Shoals is run by Cornell and the University of New Hampshire, and our mission is undergraduate education and research opportunities. And we also support a lot of research on this island and public programs throughout and at the end of the summer. We are coming to you from Appledore Island, which is about 10 miles off of Portsmouth, New Hampshire in the Isles of Shoals. And we're really happy to have all of you with us online and here in the room. So our format tonight is a 45 minute lecture followed by 15 minutes Q&A. So think of all your questions, write them down. We will take them at the end. For those of you online, if you can use the, the um, Q&A box that's down at the bottom, I will read your questions out loud at the end. Um, don't be shy. Uh, we love questions out here. And if anyone's online that needs help, Casey is on the staff and she's standing by online and you can ask her questions in the Q&A or the chat and um, she will help you out. There she is. And so tonight we are super psyched to have our first speaker, uh, Christina Kamen with us. She is assistant professor at the School of Marine Science at the University of Maine. She has an undergraduate from the University of Maryland in biology and psychology. She has a master's in zoology from the University of Cambridge and a PhD in ecology from Duke. She is now, as I said, at the University of Maine and she and her lab are committed to One Health. How many of you know what One Health is? If you haven't heard this term before, it's really cool. It is the intersection of human and wildlife and ecosystem health. So it could be something that you will find interesting, um, dive into, and certainly Carrie knows a lot, and Christina is going to talk about it tonight. Her lab uses molecular and analytical approaches to better understand aspects of ecology, evolution, and conservation biology. And her work covers a lot of ground, but she primarily focuses on marine mammal species because they are sentinels of the health and uh, conservation of the ocean. And she's going to be speaking to us tonight about the importance and value of an interdisciplinary approach to marine mammal conservation. So welcome, Christina. We're really happy to have you with us. Thank you so much. I am... Um... So glad to be here. I'm sorry that I can't be there in person. Um, it looks like a beautiful evening at the Shoals Marine Lab, but I am looking forward to spending the next hour with you all, at least in this remote And thank you so much for the invitation uh, to be here and kick off your Rock Talk seminar series. What I'd like to do uh, in the next hour is um, spend some time with you all thinking about seals in the Gulf of Maine in the past, present, and future, reflect a little bit on my own professional path that has brought me to where I am today, and um, through this process, I hope to offer some perspectives and reflections on what I see as the value of pushing ourselves or finding ourselves out of our own depth, out of our comfort zone as we work towards finding solutions to the marine mammal conservation issues that we face today. Um, and I will try to make the claim that we should, um, one way to do this, one valuable way to do this is through interdisciplinary science. So during my seminar today, as I said, I'm gonna invite you to join me on a journey through time. And I'm actually gonna ask you to take two journeys with me. One is the SEALS journey that you see here, and the other is my own. So together we will trace the history of SEALS in Maine from the time when the coastline was inhabited by the Wabanaki people through today. And along the way, I'm gonna share a little bit with, with you about how I um, grew from the small girl that you see up here on the screen, born in Booth Bay Harbor, Maine, with a very early love of seals into the person that I am today, who continues to love those seals passionately, but perhaps appreciates a bit more of the complexity than my three-year-old self did back then. So as I said, I was born in um, Booth Bay Harbor, Maine, 
and I have fond memories of taking boat trips out with my parents and seeing images that look something like this with seals popping their heads up. And the water are hauling out on rocky outcroppings on the coast of Maine. I attribute that, that um, time, early time on the water to uh, much of my career path that I chose um, thereafter. I moved to Maryland when I was five. And so as Jen said, I uh, got my bachelor's at the University of Maryland in biology and psychology. It was at a landlocked state um, college, but took every opportunity I could to uh, get my feet wet. Um, literally and figuratively in the field of marine mammal science. And that included an internship with the um, National Aquarium in Baltimore, where I got to work with their marine mammal stranding organization and got my first taste of what it was like to be hands-on involved in um, contributing to the health and welfare of marine mammal populations, something that you'll see is still very intricately linked to the work that I do today. After I finished my bachelor's at the University of Maryland, I had a strong desire to go abroad. And so I did my master's at the University of Cambridge, where I combined um, the genetic techniques that I had learned as an undergraduate research assistant at the University of Maryland with my passion for marine mammals. And I studied the immune system genes of gray seals, trying to understand, um, again, something about how their genetics might influence the health of their populations. And then for my PhD, I came back across the pond, back to the US, did my PhD at the Duke University Marine Lab located on the coast of North Carolina, where I actually studied a population of bottlenose dolphins in the Gulf of Mexico on the western coast of Florida. Again, trying to take a genetic approach to answering questions about the health of this population, in this case, their susceptibility to toxic or harmful algal blooms. And then I found myself full circle back in Maine about 10 years ago. Um, moved back for a postdoc and then the faculty position at the University of Maine. And while I've been here, I have had a wonderful experience both connecting with the boots on the ground or sneakers on the beach uh, kinds of folks in terms of um, stranding organizations like Marine Mammals of Maine that are out there responding to sick and stranded marine mammals on the beach, while also setting up a research and teaching program at the University of Maine, where I have a molecular lab that has offered me an awesome opportunity to train students. And this is where I'm gonna pause my personal story for here, um, or per, I'm gonna pause my personal story here for now. So it will leave me at 2017 when I was just starting as an assistant professor. And I'll switch gears a little bit to tell you about some of the work that kicked off my research program there. But first, I'd like to ask you all to join me. Um, for those of you on Shoals, this, this might be quite, or at Shoals, this might be quite easy. For those of you remotely, I'll ask you to use your imagination as well. And I'd love for you to close your eyes or glance out the window if you're on the coast. Imagine you're standing anywhere in the Gulf of Maine. You can pick your favorite spot. And I want you to think for a second with your eyes closed about what you see as you're standing on your favorite spot in the Gulf of Maine. And here it is. This is my one slide where a few times I'm going to ask for some audience participation if possible. So I'd love to hear a few responses um, from, from those of you in the room and, and Jen can help transfer your responses out to the, the virtual audience. What do you see with your eyes closed or open looking out that window? What do you see on your favorite spot on the Gulf of Maine coast? Add something. Okay, getting walking over to student just checking this is working okay yep i can hear you do you want me to, to just describe what i see i'd love for you to tell me one or two things that you see a specific location <laughs> um you can be anywhere on the gulf of maine um well i work a lot on the the islands of casco bay so i see a lot of you know Conifer islands and rocky coastline, a lot of intertidal space. Great, thank you. So you're describing the natural environment that you see around you, the physical landscape. All right, here comes another. Definitely seagulls and lots of birds. Great, birds, okay. Yeah, you got something? Who's got something? Here comes another one. Up to. I see a, a tall three-masted ship. Wonderful. That sounds beautiful. You see a ship. So we see some people in our environment. Going over here. All right. Going over.
the sun and like a lot of really pretty clouds. The sun and the clouds. Weather. Anyone else? We saw a whale on the way out here, anybody? There's been whales. Tom saw a whale. Seals, lots of seals. Thank you, yes. Seals what kind of animals. seals, anyone? Gray seals are being shouted out. Great. They All will right. feature prominently in our story. Thank you, wonderful. All right. So what I heard was we see the natural environment, we see a physical landscape, we see aspects of weather and water, we see animals that live in that natural environment, and we also see evidence of humans in that space. So now I want you to close your eyes again, put yourself back in that exact same spot, wherever it was you were. But now I want you to imagine that you're standing in that spot 500 years ago. And I imagine that this might be more difficult. Your vision might be a bit more blurry. It's harder to know what that spot might have looked like 500 years ago. And just one last time, third and last time, close your eyes again and imagine you're back in that same spot. But now think of what that spot might look like 50 years into the future. And again, this is more challenging, but perhaps you're drawing on what this spot might look like 50 years in the future from what it looks like now, or what you thought it looked like 500 years ago. And those linkages across time are important to our story today. So I'm gonna tell my story in two parts. The first part will focus on how seal populations in the Gulf of Maine have changed over time. And so this is the looking back to present. And I first attempted to answer this question by diving into the literature. So this is an image of Folklore Library, which is located on the University of Maine um, campus. And I literally walked into the stacks of Folklore Library for some of this research. And, um, looking at literature that is that is not yet uh, made it to the remote realm or the online realm quite as easily as others and you'll see that. And then I also um, dove into the lab and had students who worked with me and used molecular techniques to answer this question of how have seal populations in the Gulf of Maine changed over time. And so what I'm going to try to do in the next few minutes is offer you a very brief history of seal populations in the Northwest Atlantic and walk you through what I learned. This first image is an artist's reconstruction of a Wabanaki encampment on the coast of Maine approximately 3,000 years ago. And I would like to take a moment here to acknowledge that the land that I'm standing on today in Penobscot County, um, where the University of Maine is located, is in the homeland of the Penobscot Nation. And I'm aware that the island where you all sit, or at least those of you on Appledore Island, we also know was visited on a seasonal basis by Native American people. And so in this image that you see in front of you, the focus of our story today is here. So here we can see in this image, the suggestion that follows the oral histories and the archeological record showing that um, harvested seals on the coast of Maine for subsistence use. People have reconstructed Wabanaki food years where they showed the different natural resources that these peoples relied on at different times of year. And seals feature prominently right now in those June, July, August, September months. And this corresponds with harbor seal pupping season where we know that harbor seals are located um, in close proximity to coastlines and probably easier to harvest when the Wabanaki people were at their um, summer coastal camps. We can't know exactly how many seals were present at the time, um, but we can assume that they were found locally in, in close coastal proximity and that they were common enough to be a valuable natural resource in subsistence hunts for the Wabanaki. I'm now gonna zoom us forward um, to the arrival of uh, European explorer, excuse me, European explorers and an uptick in exploit the exploitation of our Gulf of Maine seal populations. European explorers, um, well, sorry, this is our, our map here. And again, pointing out, this is our seal um, in this, this drawn map of the, the region, Canadian Maritimes and um, New England. And in those records, those books that I found in the stacks of the library, um, we see the, the boat logs or ship logs of the early European explorers who came over to the Canadian Maritimes, to New England, landed on the Isles of Shoals in the early 1600s, 
Captain Richard Strong describes the Canadian Maritimes as um, hosting exceeding great stores of seals. Samuel de Champlain describes the same region as finding shores completely covered with seals. I believe the Isles of Shoals was described as a good fishing place, though without much good ground for gardening. And so um, here again, we don't have exact numbers, but we can get the sense that seals were abundant in this environment. And Samuel de Champlain's writings go on to say, those seals that, excuse me, those shores that were completely covered with seals, they took as many as they wished. Zooming forward again, um, I'm going to take us to the last 150 years of time, which has actually been a quite tumultuous period of time in the region. This timeline here shows you how there were dramatic swings back and forth between periods of time where there were local laws put in place to protect seals that were considered attractive to residents and tourists, and other periods of time where there were bounties in place um, justified as it put it, being put in place to protect the fishing industry. And these bounties were state or local government based. This means that um, governments were paying people per seal snout, as in you brought in your snout, which was evidence of having killed or removed a seal from the population. And at different points in time, you were paid 50 cents up to a dollar um, for that snout. And again, looking at the written record this time of the Maine state legislature, we see quotes that suggest that these bounties were to put in place because um, seals were considered the biggest detriment to the fishing industry of anything that fishermen had to contend with at the time in the early 1900s. That seals were killing thousands and thousands of dollars worth of fish. That the fishing state industry in the state of Maine has a quote unquote serious problem. Here we actually do get some numbers of how many seals, at least how many seals were killed uh, because they were paid for. And so we have written records of those bounties. And the estimates range from 72,000 to 135,000. So let's say around about 100,000 seals were removed from Maine and Massachusetts from the late mid to late 1800s to the mid 1900s. We don't have good information about species here, but we do think um, that these bounties resulted in the local extirpation of gray seal breeding colonies throughout the Gulf of Maine and the extirpation of, of harbor seal breeding colonies south of Maine. So let's zoom forward to our final chapter for this part of our story, the chapter of protection and population growth. In 1972, the US federal government passed the Marine Mammal Protection Act, making it illegal to take marine mammals. Take here means harass, hunt, capture, kill, or attempt to do any of those things. And so this is a federal law that protects all marine mammals. And while the bounty programs showed us that we are in fact quite good at removing animals when we consider them pests and when we um, put our efforts to doing so, the Marine Mammal Protection Act has shown us that we can also protect and conserve uh, our marine mammals, at least some of them quite successfully. And so here again, we have even more concrete numbers in terms of how many seals are present. And I'll tell you first, the values for harbor seals, which made the earlier recovery. Our first scientific study of harbor seals in the state of Maine was conducted by a graduate student at the University of Maine and commissioned by the state in 1947. And that estimate was at around 3,000 harbor seals. In 1973, just a year after the Marine Mammal Protection Act was passed, the first complete census of harbor seals in the Northwest Atlantic was completed. And here the estimate is closer to 6,000. 1981, we began doing aerial surveys. So they count seals now by flying, uh, low flying planes, small planes over the coast, counting seals that are hauled out on land and then correcting those counts for the number of seals they believe to be on land versus in the water at any given point in time. So the first of those aerial surveys in 1981 was at around 10 and a half thousand. And as we jump forward, um, the aerial surveys that have occurred since then, we can see that our numbers are, are beginning to level up at around 60,000. Today, um, we estimate the total population of harbor seals in the Northwest, uh, excuse me, in US waters um, in the Northwest Atlantic to be around 75,000 animals. And here we see similar trends um, for gray seals. Gray seals were covered later on in the United States. So these two plots show you Sable Island, which is located off the coast of Nova Scotia. It's the largest gray seal breeding colony in the world. And on the right, we see um, a small island, Muskegon Island, located off the coast of Massachusetts and on Cape Cod. And I want to point out these two curves look 
quite similar in that they both show rapid exponential growth. So we have pup production in thousands on the y-axis here and time on x. But our x-axis are actually different in scale. So gray seals in Canada began recovering in the early 1970s. This didn't begin happening in the US waters really until the 1990s. Now it's quite recent and that means that gray seals were largely absent in what we consider modern memories. There are people alive today in Cape Cod that grew up at a time when there were no gray seals present. And you all looking out your window, right? Or, or taking a short boat right across can, can speak to the opposite. We now see many gray seals in the Gulf of Maine, but this is different, very different from what it looked like just a few decades ago. The most recent estimates um, here were come from 2016, where we estimate about um, 424,000 gray seals in Canada and 27,000 in US waters, um, though acknowledging that seals do move across that international boundary. We actually think that a lot of the growth of the gray seal population in Maine and Massachusetts was fed by immigration from the Canadian source population that recovered earlier. And today we like to say that gray seals are so abundant they can be viewed by, from space. So Google Earth satellite image or each one of those small black rice grains is a gray seal um, on Cape Cod. So I want to zoom out just for a second. My story today is pretty focused on gray and harbor seals in the Gulf of Maine, but um, they are a case study that is not uncommon in the United States. So here you're seeing population trends for all pinniped species. Those are all seals and sea lions that breed in the contiguous US. So excluding Alaska and Hawaii, where we still have endangered pinniped species, here we can see that since 1972, when the Remail Protection Act was passed, um, that all seal, seal and sea lion populations in contiguous US have shown population growth. All right, so we now have some answers to that question. How have seal populations in the Gulf of Maine changed over time? And I've told you a little bit about these two seals here, the gray seals and the harbor seals. As I said, they're gonna be the strongest feature in our story today. Um, though we do also, I will say, have harp and hooded seals that do occasionally make their ways into the Gulf of Maine as well. Now, as I said, I'm a molecular ecologist. I have a genetics lab. And so um, the second part, part 1B, if you'll, if you'll let me, of this first part is thinking not just about how the number of, seal pop, number of seals has changed in the Gulf of Maine over time, but how their genetic diversity has changed. And I think that this distinction here is important in that we can learn something um, complementary, but perhaps slightly distinct by understanding the genetic diversity of these animals and acknowledge that genetic diversity has a strong impact on contemporary fitness. Um, so it's an important aspect of the health of these animals today. To study genetic diversity, I need physical samples. I need um, most cases uh, skin samples or tissue samples and analyze. And so here I've had the great fortune of working with an awesome set of collaborators throughout um, Canada and uh, the United States who have provided gray seal skin samples from the three starred sites that you see here. So Muskegon Island on Cape Cod, Gulf of St. Lawrence and Sable Island in Canada. And though I haven't been able to get into the field with them um, yet, I wanted to show you some images of what this field work looks like. This is an image from several years ago um, now of the awesome team, scientific team of collaborators from um, government agencies, academic institutions, marine mammal stranding networks uh, around the primarily the Northeast um, who come together for a few wonderful days in the middle of the winter uh, to capture gray seals. And so this work typically happens in January, which is when gray seals uh, pup, give birth to their pups here in the Gulf of Maine. So these folks go out to beaches that look like this. Each of these little white, um, little white uh, fur balls on this island are gray seal pups next to mom. They approach pups collect those pups. Um, they take the pups only after they've been weaned, so they don't disrupt the mother-pup bond when they are collecting scientific information. 
They weigh the animals. They take a variety of information from them. They draw blood, which they can use to test for diseases and collect other information about the animal's health. They put a small flipper tag on the gray seal pup slippers. So they can identify that animal again when they um, spot it in the future. And this process, essentially like piercing of an ear, is what provides me the skin sample that I can take back into the lab for genetics. And before I move forward, I do just want to acknowledge here that this work is all conducted under federal permits. And so um, the work that they done, they do that there is very carefully evaluated to make sure that it's in the best benefit of the population and that the risks to any individual um, animal is minimized. The other folks that I had the great fortune of working with um, for this project were those that provided me, with, provided me with samples from seals from 500 years ago. That period of time that I asked you to try to imagine, we have physical specimens from that period of time. And these come from collaborators uh, in the University of Maine Anthropology Department who run an archaeology field camp um, in Down East Maine in Machias Bay, where they have recovered uh, seal bones, and in particular seal ear bones that are very dense and preserve DNA that I can then extract and learn something about what the seal's genetic diversity was like 500 years ago. So when I put these genetic, I'm, I'm sort of framing this as looking at genetic diversity. When I actually look at data like that, um, I like to visualize them in what's called a haplotype network. And I'll walk you through this example here and then show you um, what this looks like over time, because that's our question. So with these haplotype networks, each circle, each colored circle represents a different genetic variant, um, a different genetic haplotype or different type. The size of the circle represents how many individuals in my sample size had that particular variant. And here they're coded as pie charts where the different colors represent the different geographical um, sampling sites. And the other piece of information we can get from these haplotype networks is how different two haplotypes are from one another. And that information you can get by following any of these circles through those lines from one to the other. So the further apart um, or the longer that, that line connecting two dots is, the more steps you have to take, the more divergent those haplotypes are. So this is what those networks look like for the gray seal. The one I just showed you with samples from Sable Island, the Gulf of St. Lawrence and Muskegon is on the bottom. And here it's contrasted on top with a mirror image um, from the archaeological specimens. And the map here, the network, is drawn so that each contains the exact same haplotypes, but the, are open circles if that haplotype wasn't observed at that point in time. And the dashed vertical lines connect the two haplotypes, uh, or excuse me, connect haplotypes that were observed in both time periods. So when I look at this for gray seals, what I see is one, our modern network is highly diverse. There are lots of haplotypes, suggesting that the population is very genetically diverse. I look back in time and you can see here, the sample size is much smaller. So this was drawn, the modern network is drawn from um, close to 300 individuals. The archeological network is drawn from eight individual specimens. But what was amazing to me is that each of those eight specimens had a unique haplotype that they were also drawn from a large genetically diverse population. But only one of those eight haplotypes was also found amongst the almost 300 individuals sequenced today, suggesting that this gray seals that lived in Maine about 500 years ago may have looked genetically different um, than the gray seals that exist there today. Here's that same type of model for our harbor seals and we can see here a lot um, more, relatively more vertical lines suggesting there were more haplotypes that were present in the archeological specimen that were also observed today. So those, uh, we can sort of tentatively conclude that there are large differences between modern and archeological networks, particularly for gray seals and slightly less so for harbor seals. Recognizing that between that archeological specimen time point and the modern specimen time point, we had those um, we had that European exploitation and those bounties that drastically decreased that population before they recovered again. We can also use that genetic data to actually test um, demographic scenarios like the one that I just described. So we can look in the genome to see if it tells us that same story that the 
um, my deep dive into the library records showed. And here we do hypothesis testing where we test, in this case, five different scenarios, one of no population size over time, one of expansion, one of reduction. And then we get a little bit more complicated, the ones that combine um, reduction followed by expansion, a bottleneck scenario or expansion, then a bottleneck. And our genetic data support either of these two bottleneck scenarios for both species, suggesting that that signature of population bottleneck when the population got small before it grew again is still present in the genomes of the animals that live today. So they are still, um, their genomes at least tell cell that lingering story. And we can then estimate back in time um, what population sizes might have looked like from purely from the genetic data. And here you can see, again, because those gray seals showed more of a difference between archaeological and modern time points that um, the genetic data are suggesting that those gray seals went through more of an extreme bottleneck than the harbor seals. And this may be, as I said, because that gray seal population living in Maine today is actually um, being sourced from a Canadian population, and maybe we wiped out that main specific or Gulf of Maine specific genetic diversity. These type of data uh, to me have value because there are implications for how we manage protected species, particularly in systems that lack historical baselines. The first part of my story, the library part, told you that there used to be a lot of seals, but I couldn't tell you how many. And so adding that additional layer of the genetic data that confirms or um, let me say that differently, that adds additional evidence in support of that population bottleneck and that these seal populations used to be large, helps us understand or think about um, how big we want the populations to be now or how big we want them to be moving into the, into the future. So this is what our, our current looks like, right? Our today looks like lots of seals co-located very closely to human inhabited coastal, um, coastal communities. And we can celebrate their recovery, we can celebrate their return or their, their process of recovering um, their population growth. We can also acknowledge that there are um, members of our community that are concerned over the growth of these populations of seals. And their concerns come from a few different angles. There's concerns over pinnipeds as predators. So those same motivations that, um, led to the bounties of the late 1800s and early 1900s, pinnipeds as predators, pinnipeds as competitors with local recreational commercial fishermen. Those same concerns are still present today. We have new concerns about the role that seals play as prey in the environment, particularly their, um, their role in attracting white sharks to uh, coastal swimmable waters. And we have some concern over the role that these animals might play as disease reservoirs, particularly of diseases that may be transmissible to humans. So where do we go from here? In this circle, um, I have walked you through the depletion that occurred, the protection and creation that occurred, causing population growth. We are likely somewhere on this curve right now, but where exactly we don't know. At what point we reach recovery, maybe we're already there. And then the question becomes, what's next? So if we stick with the status quo, continue to protect our populations, the populations continue to grow. Um, and there are those members of, again, our community who are concerned about that. We could reduce protections or we could change policies entirely, removing their protections, but does then that renew or start our circle over again, right? We, ideally, we learn from history. Now with this question of what do we do next, this is where I'm a bit out of my depth. As a trained natural scientist, I'm quite comfortable working with data. I, you know, working in the lab and with um, crunching numbers, that's my happy place. I, I um, take comfort in having evidence to support my decisions. And yet that's not enough um, to deal with, with challenging or wicked marine mammal conservation issues like what do we do with recovering pinnipeds and this concern over there. Um, population growth. And I turn to others and I grapple with those others and think about where we go next. I paused my story earlier in 2017 when I started at the University of Maine and you've heard a little bit about what I've done with that time so far. Um, one of the wonderful pieces of that last um, 
five or six years of time has been the collaborations that I've been able to build, communities that I've grown to be a part of, uh, organizations like the Northwest Atlantic Seal Research Consortium, which is a multi-stakeholder group interested in um, issues of ocean health with seals as their focal point, with the amazing members of the Marine Mammal Stranding Networks that you see on the left, with state and federal agencies, and then with other groups at the University of Maine, including the One Health Initiative that brings together my questions of animal health with questions of human health and environmental health. And so this brings me to part two of my story, which will be um, the shorter half of our story today. And this is where I will tell you a little bit about how we're trying to study the impact of marine mammal recovery in our system. And I will highlight for you and applaud the work of two of my current PhD students, Christina McCosker, who's in a One Health program on campus, and Julia Sinnerberg, who's in an eDNA-focused program. I'll tell you what that is, if that's a new term for you. Christina's work is contributing to our understanding of how healthy the seal populations are today in the Gulf of Maine. And Julia's work is thinking about how we can use eDNA to non-invasively study seal populations. And in both of these spaces, um, these students are collaborating not only with natural scientists, but also with social scientists to think about the utility of their data uh, for making policy-based decisions. We approach this question of how healthy seal populations are in the Gulf of Maine, both in the lab at the University of Maine and in the field um, with those samples taken from wild captures. So wild populations, like I uh, showed you images from the gray seal pup captures in Massachusetts, as well as data collected from marine mammal stranding networks who respond to those animals um, when members of the public call in with concern about them on their beach. And I'm interested in this question about how these seal populations are, one, for the selfish reason of, of caring about seals, but also because um, there are many reasons why seals make good sentinels of coastal, coastal ocean health. So with this One Health umbrella, I wonder what we can learn about the broader ecosystem health in the Gulf of Maine by studying marine mammals. In the field with our stranding network members, we ask and answer questions like when, where, and why do marine mammals strand in the Gulf of Maine? We've plotted temporal and spatial trends, and what we can draw from these are things like gray seal strandings are increasing in the Gulf of Maine as their population numbers have increased over time, and that seal strandings often occur near human population centers like um, around Portland, mid-coast southern Maine, and around Cape Cod. We can look at why these animals are stranding and in particular look for evidence of human interaction. In the state of Maine, um, at least from 2007 to 2019, for harbor harp and gray seals, human interaction is reported in about 15% of strandings. And that's from a data set of about 3,500 strandings that occurred during that period of time. And if we look at that over time, we can see that human interaction rate ticking slowly up over time. 75% of those cases of human interaction cases involve what's broadly termed harassment. Other types of human interaction can include things like um, vessel trauma or entanglement or fisheries interaction. But in the state of Maine, the largest form of human interaction that our seals face is harassment, which is really broadly defined at the national level. So one of my undergraduate students did a really awesome deep dive into the stranding records and described the various flavors of harassment cases that occur. These um, vary from things like human approach, um, physical contact, like petting, touching seals, displacing them from land or from water, so picking them up out of the water or pushing them back into the water, collecting them, literally taking them home and putting them in their bathtub and you know, the extreme versions of these cases, covering them with towels, wet towels, trying to feed them on the beach. Many times these cases are well-intentioned, but ultimately harmful for the animals that are involved. And we can use that type of information to um, help marine mammal stranding networks figure out where and how to uh, best address these issues. And um, they've done some great uh, public service announcements to try to mitigate this type of human interaction. Now you might've noticed as I flipped quickly through some of those slides showing you numbers of, of strandings over time that there are some peaks and valleys in those numbers. And those peaks are of particular interest to me. So for example, a peak in 
2006 in our stranding record, again in 2011, again in 2018, and then I don't have any data because it was just last summer, but again in 2022. These peaks are termed unusual mortality events. And in our system, um, they are often caused by uh, outbreaks of infectious disease like foci distemper virus and influenza A virus. And these outbreaks most often cause um, these peaks in our harbor seal strandings, but we don't see um, similar peaks in our gray seal populations, suggesting that there's something different about the gray seals and the harbor seals. Um, they might be a relatively resistant reservoir species, meaning that they're able to carry the disease without um, showing symptomatic effects. And if that's the case, then there are those additional implications for the fact that the gray seal population is growing. And we're looking at some of those questions as well, trying to understand what is it that makes gray seals and harbor seals different. Going back to the roots of my master's program way back when in Cambridge, where I looked at immune system genes and trying to understand if there's a difference somehow encoded in the genomes of gray and, gray and harbor seals that makes gray seals more resistant to diseases and harbor seals more susceptible. So finally, in the last few minutes, I wanna share with you one other exciting avenue of research. This is Julia's work where we're trying to develop um, environmental DNA, eDNA approaches to non-invasively sample marine mammals in their communities. Um, eDNA is based on the premise that we all slough signatures of ourselves in the environments that we pass through. And so these animals leave behind in the water bodies that they live in and move through skin cells, um, fur, other biological material from which we can extract their DNA. And so we can take a liter of DNA and extract, sea, excuse me, a liter of water, seawater, and extract seal DNA without ever seeing, without ever touching, without ever handling, catching, capturing that seal. This is a very different way of getting those DNA samples than what I described earlier. It has limitations, um, but we're, we're trying to push the envelope here a little bit and see how far we can take this. We started in a controlled setting in those rehabilitation settings, making sure that we could get seal DNA out of water coming from a, a rehab pool with a seal in it. This is an awesome example of partnering with those marine mammals training organizations and um, the undergraduate students that get to work with at the University of Maine. Check, yes, we can get seal DNA out of a pool of water. We've then gone out to gray seal um, haulouts off of Cape Cod, working with collaborators at the Center for Coastal Studies. This is again, an open ocean environment, one in close proximity to large numbers of seals. And here again, we can actually detect gray seal eDNA uh, consistently 50 meters from shore, which is the distance that you are recommended to stay away from any marine mammal to avoid um, disrupting it. And even up to 150 meters from shore in some cases. And our data are, are encouraging in that they're consistent with expectations. We can see higher concentrations of this eDNA closer to shore and we can further away. These results are preliminary, and so it's the next few slides that I'll show you. So this is work that is very much still in its early stages. We can also not only detect gray seal eDNA, but we can identify different haplotypes, the different types that can tell us something about the diversity of a population, again, just from a liter of water. And what we're seeing, again, is encouraging in that the frequencies of haplotypes that we're finding in our eDNA samples Seem to, um, seem to be similar to the haplotypes that we were seeing from our tissue samples in those earlier studies from that population. And finally, we've taken the eDNA into the Penobscot River. So this is a very different environment um, in Maine, fast flowing riverine water with less abundant seal populations, but we still do have some seal haulouts here. And here we're interested in looking at that bigger ecosystem level picture. So can we co-detect gray seals and potential prey? with eDNA samples. This is work funded by the Maine Outdoor Heritage Fund and done in collaboration with Maine Sea Grant and NOAA. And we first are able to use eDNA, not just to detect a single species, but to give us a snapshot of a full community of the potential prey fish that might be present. So we're seeing here at different um, sampling events over time, um, each of these different colors, um, colored bars represents different fish species that are detected. And of particular interest to us are things like alewife and blueback herring. 
which are also the focus of restoration efforts in this region and potential prey for the seal species. But we also detect things like menhaden and shad, so other anadromous fish that are moving back up from ocean uh, marine environments into freshwater environments, as well as things like striped bass, um, which may be of interest to recreational fishermen in the environment. And we can um, look over space and time at how many river herring are present. And this is where we'll add our layer of, of seal detections on top of this as well to see um, how closely those align. So I know that was a quick whirlwind through what we're working on now. Um, but our hope is that, that these types of studies, again, I focused here primarily on the natural science side, but each of these has a complementary um, interdisciplinary component, and we're combining oceanography with molecular ecology, with um, field-based ecology, and try to answer this question of what's next. And again, I'm out of my depth on my own here, um, and so I rely on, on amazing collaborators around the region. I've told you my two stories over time, that of the seal and, and my own path here. I look forward to um, discussing and answering any questions that you have about this and, and reflecting further upon this as they go forward. Um, but I'd just like to conclude uh, by encouraging you, those of you who are out on Apple Tour right now, to embrace those moments where you may find yourself out of your depth in a different learning environment than perhaps you've been in in the past and find value in um, learning from new and diverse people and disciplines in that space. Again, I wish I could be there in person to join you all for some of that. Um, I just was able to grab pictures and it looks like an amazing space. Uh, so I, I know that you'll, you'll have a good time there. The work that I've done is largely collaborative. And so I have to acknowledge the many, many, many folks and institutions who have provided um, samples and knowledge and data, as well as those who have provided funding for this work. And I'll leave it there. So thank you all for your attention. Happy to answer and address any questions. And I've also got my email address up there. So if um, you prefer to reach out to me um, afterwards, uh, that's the best way to get in contact with me. And I'm happy to continue the conversation. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Dr. Kamen. Uh, we would love to take your questions in the room. I will bring the mic around. So please raise your hand if you're online. You can put your questions in the Q and and I'll read that out loud. Any questions in the room? Hello, um, I'm just wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about the quality of the genetic information that you're getting from the bones that you were talking about with the archaeological project because in my home laboratory I do a lot with tissue and blood and even um, ear punctures but we have to be so careful with it to keep it fresh and stuff like that that I'm really interested to know what you can tell from a bone that's really old. Yeah the DNA is definitely lower quality far lower quality and far um, less concentrated than DNA that you get from those modern samples. So you have to take certain precautions and you work in, in actually designated labs, um, particularly to avoid contamination. It's actually quite parallel in that way with the eDNA where you don't ever wanna be um, working in a space where more concentrated DNA can contaminate your less concentrated DNA. So when I say it's more degraded, that means the fragments are shorter. So we did have to redesign our um, protocols to be able to work with more fragmented DNA. Um, and I was working with mitochondrial markers, which are um, found in higher concentration than nuclear markers. So there were sort of strategies that we took to take advantage of um, the lower quality DNA. And we, had, we didn't have as high of a success rate in terms of some of our samples failed and we weren't able to get usable DNA out of them. I will also say that there's been, there, has been and there continue to be great advances in this space. Like we're getting, you know, full genomes right now out of um, archaeological specimens, not in my lab, but in in the broader field. And so, uh, people are finding more and more ways to capture the little bits of DNA that are left. Who else has a question?
All right, Thomas Wan. Thank you, Professor. Uh, could you please um, summarize the similarities and the differences that you've discovered in, in, in the immune systems between humans and marine mammals? Yeah, so um, our work that we have completed so far has focused on something called the major histocompatibility complex. It's a part of the immune system that is important for recognizing pathogens and, and sort of kicking off or initiating the appropriate immune response. This is a part of the immune system that is shared across um, humans and marine mammals. I've looked at it in gray and harbor seals. Um, and haven't done a direct comparison with humans. But what we see in gray and harbor seals is that um, these regions are diverse as we know them to be across mammalian species. That diversity helps the immune system be able to recognize the diverse array of pathogens that it may be faced with. But we do see some, some um, so we see that they're diverse in both species. But we see some interesting differences in that diversity at a super type level where there's they're clustered in terms of functionality. And at that level, it seems like gray seals may have sort of more functional diversity than harbor seals. The work that we're doing right now in the lab is um, expanding way beyond that single family of genes. We're looking across the whole genome. And so we'll be able to look at the many other different facets of the immune system that are important in responding to diseases as well. Anybody else? Questions? Yeah. Hi. Um, so I just had a question relative to the fish populations in accordance with the seal population increase. So from my limited knowledge of fish populations, there's been in Maine specifically, which is where I'm from, a pretty consistent fish depletion of populations, especially within the Gadidae family and cod and like haddock. And I was wondering, because the numbers, I mean, you see massive jumps between the years and the fisheries in Maine, as far as I know, have been pretty hard pressed in regaining fish populations. And I was wondering if you guys have any reason or know of any like data that might correlate with how the seal population is increasing with such a primary fish food source while the fish populations are decreasing at the same time? Yeah, that's a great question. And it is that that interaction between what seal populations are doing and what fish populations are doing is a hot topic in terms of that controversy, or, or I should say controversy, that conflict, perceived conflict between fish and fishermen and seals. Um, seals are opportunistic uh, foragers, so they feed on a wide variety of fish species, and that uh, makes that connection a little bit fuzzier, if you will, in terms of the fact that they are able to feed on many different prey species, not just those that are of commercial value. And th there's been a lot of work looking at seal diets, uh, and what we see is that diversity of prey species, we see geographic variation, we see some variation between species, and in most cases, we see that things like the gadids, like cod, actually make up a very small proportion of the contemporary diet. Knowing what those diets would have looked like when cod and seal were both abundant in the Gulf of Maine, um, but today that uh, they are they are feeding on a wide variety of species beyond just those uh, commercially important species. Few more minutes left. Any other questions? Dre, I know you're on this call. So, uh, any burning questions from you? Dre is one of my wonderful collaborators. <laughs> All right. Look, oh, wait, hold on. <laughs> Okay, hi. Um, I'm actually from Maryland, and I'd uh, really like to hear more about your experiences, like at the National Aquarium, because I'm like half an hour outside of Baltimore, so that sounds really cool. Oh, awesome. Okay. Um, yeah, so the National Aquarium in Baltimore has, well, I'm going to give you data or information from what it was like when I was there. So uh, 
I assume they're still running an undergraduate internship program where they place interns in a variety of different places in the aquarium. Um, and I was placed or selected to, uh, to be placed within the marine mammal stranding or stranding component of the aquarium. It's not a public facing piece of the aquarium's operations, um, but they uh, rehabilitate, they, they work with Maine, not Maine, sorry, Maryland Department um, of Natural Resources to respond to stranded animals. And again, I, I'm not sure to what extent this is still active, but at the time, um, they, they had a rehabilitation center. So they were bringing seals and sea turtles in to rehabilitate them, um, again, in, in non-public facing components of the aquarium. Uh, but I had a great experience there and um, would encourage you to, to take a look at that internship program. They run, again, they used to run a sort of summer session as well as academic sessions during the year. So Dre wants to know when you're going to come out here and do a seal survey with the surges who are on the island. I would love to. We'll figure <laughs> we'll, that out. We'll talk about that. Great. Anybody else? Okay, a couple more. Um, I'm curious about how, like where the line is drawn in terms of when you're doing surveys in the field. I know um, in order to minimize the disruption between uh, individuals like you don't um, survey calves that aren't weaned yet, but um, like mm -hmm. where is the line drawn for how like I don't know invasive something can be or how old they have to be? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, as I said, makes it illegal to take marine mammals. That includes harassment. That applies to scientists as it does to any other member of the public. There are, uh, there's a process that you apply for a permit or apply for an exception. Actually, even the fishing industry applies for exceptions because they have interactions, um, uh, unintentional interactions with, with marine mammals. So as scientists, we write permits, um, permit applications and justify um, basically that harassment or that, that potential impact on marine mammals. We have to quantify how many animals we think will be impacted and at what level. And then we have to justify that based on the, the perceived benefit to um, public knowledge. And so for the gray seal, live wild capture work, um, as I said, they, they only take animals that are weaned so they're not disrupting that critical mother pup bond. They put the pups back. They're able to, um, in, the, in those studies as well as in the bottomless dolphin work I've, I've um, done in the past, there's good evidence that animals that are captured and sampled and then put back um, as quickly as possible do just fine after the fact. So they can also build on that evidence to say that there's a short term, there's definitely a short term stress response for those animals, but the long term impact is, is, not, um, is not significant. I don't draw that line. And, I, and again, this is where I'm, I'm sometimes glad that I'm not put in a position of having to make decisions like that, but their decisions are made on best available science and by um, a, a formal permitting process. Thanks. One, there was another question over here somewhere. No? Yeah. Um, in terms of like, academics and experience do you have any advice for undergraduates who are in interested in getting involved with marine mammals before going to grad school yeah um yes uh i have advice and i have encouragement so one that i think we all hear right that the marine mammal field is competitive that's true but i don't say that to dissuade anyone from from trying it if it's what your passion is if someone had dissuaded me from from doing it at that stage I wouldn't be where I am today um, my advice in general is to get as much diverse experience as you can to try as many things as you can to figure out what you like and want to pursue and then you can speak knowledgeably about why you want to pursue that it's also valuable to try something and find out you don't like it and cross it off your list of potential future options and that experience is valuable, even if it's not with marine mammals. The genetics experience that I got as an undergraduate at the University of Maryland was with oysters. Um, but I and and I'm I chose not to continue following you know the study of the health of, of 
Florida oyster populations, but I did choose to continue with using that tool set that I gained and I transferred it to a different system that I wanted to, to use what I found to be a really powerful tool set to answer questions um, that I was passionate about. And so I think that's one piece of value and encouragement to you that any experience that you get, um, you can find ways to transfer into the marine mammal field as a graduate student and you'll be able to speak to it. A very specific piece of advice is also to sign up for a listserv called MARMAM, M-A-R-M-A-M. It's the listserv that the International Marine Mammal Science Community uses. It will flood your inbox. You'll get an email every day. Um, but that's where all the marine mammal internship opportunities are advertised, where new publications are put out, where conferences are advertised, where um, jobs are posted. And so it gives you a really good flavor of the current and future potential opportunities for you in the marine mammal field. Awesome, thank you so much. That was great. Thank you all. You guys need that website again? Cause I saw a bunch of you writing it down. Can you say that website one more time? Yeah, it's a listserv. It's, it's called M-A-R-M-A-M. -M. So like marine mammal, the first three letters of both of those words. And if you just Google MARMAM um, or MARMAM Lister, it, you should be able to get instructions pretty easily about how to sign up. If anyone has any problems doing so um, or, or needs that in an email, feel free to, to shoot me an email with, or shoot, yeah, shoot me an email, email address on the slide, and I'm happy to direct you to it. Awesome. Thank you so much. So thank you for that really great talk. Um, all for all of you online and in the room, all of our talks in the seminar series are recorded and they're on our website. Casey has put together a great website. When you leave, you can still join us on these talks. So um, feel free to be part of the community all summer long. So hope to see you there. Next week on the 13th is Dr. Gabby Brandt from New Hampshire Sea Grant. She specializes on invasive species in the Gulf of Maine. She's really quite known for her green crabs and other edible invaders. So she helps, she does research and helps develop commercial markets for invasive species, basically eat our way out of problems, which sounds delicious to me. So all of these talks, signing up for them, they're all on our website, shoalsmarinelaboratory.org. You can join us all summer there, and I hope that you will. Thank you all for your attention and thank you so much, Dr. Kamen, for your talk tonight. We'll see you later. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.